Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Felipe Chertu. I am the Vice President of the Sciences Po Policy Project. And uh, I am Adam Lahoudi. I am the Senior Director of Relations at SP3. And we will be today's Masters of Ceremony for our conference with Dr. Yaron Brook. Dr. Brook is an Israeli-American intellectual, best-selling author, public speaker, and host of The Yaron Brook Show, specializing in Ayn Rand's philosophy of objectivism, as developed in many of her works, most notably Atlas Shrugged. At present, Dr. Brooks serves as the chairman of the board of the Ayn Rand Institute after having served as its executive director for over 17 years. Dr. Brooks has, apl has applied the objectivist philosophy through many realms in life, having been awarded an award winning, having been an award winning professor at Santa Clara University, founding his own financial advisory, private equity group and hedge fund, which he presently directs. And lastly, as a regular col columnist to the Forbes magazine. Thus, it is most appropriate that he has joined us today to speak on the ethics of capitalism, a topic which finds much contemporary scrutiny in the halls of academia and public life. The format for today will focus primarily on encouraging debate with our students. Dr. Yuren Brook will begin with a 20 minute lecture on the ethics of capitalism, providing his thesis and worldview in relation to, to today's topic. Then this will be followed by a question from myself and Adam, after which we'll be opening up to engagement from the audience. We remind you to be respectful and courteous, remaining open-minded, uh, to a view which may diverge from your own. <laughs> Before beginning, please note that the Sciences Po Policy Project is, a non is non-partisan and encourages speakers from all creeds to come and share and take their opinion on a wide range of political, social, and philosophical topics. So without further ado, let us give a round of applause in introducing Dr. Yaron Brook. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, and uh, yes, what I'm going to say is uh, going to strike some of you as pretty controversial and uh, might upset some of you. So tough. Um, but I'm looking forward to a uh, to a, uh, a good exchange of ideas and a good debate uh, afterwards. I'm, I'm curious. I think I know the answer, but I just I just want to know um, how many of you have read anything by Ayn Rand? I figured as much. Um, how many of you have even heard of Ayn Rand before you saw the posters or me or anything like that? Okay, a number of you have heard of her. Uh, some of you have not heard of her at all. Uh, I'm happy you know, to take any questions about her if you're interested in that, but since I've only got 20 minutes, let me focus on the question at hand, which is the question of the morality of capitalism. In what way is capitalism moral? Is it at all moral? But first, let's ask the question of what do we mean by morality? What is it that we mean when we talk about morality of a system, morality of a social, political, economic system? I don't view capitalism, by the way, just narrowly as just economic. I think it's broader than that. I think it's an entire political, social system. Um, and, and I'll define what I mean by capitalism in a minute. But before we get to that, we need to talk about what is morality, because I have a different conception of morality than many people out there. Uh, I believe that when judging a social, political, economic system, there's only one standard that should apply. And that is the extent to which that political system enables human flourishing. So to me, morality is the ability of individuals to flourish, to succeed, to live a good life, to live a life of where they can pursue their happiness, where they can pursue their values based on their own judgment. So not based on some authoritarian telling them what they can and cannot do, not based on some dogma that says that they have to live a particular way. But what is moral is a system, is a system that leaves individuals free to make choices about their life, to choose the values they pursue, and then to leave them free to actually pursue those values and hopefully attain them. No system can guarantee happiness. No system can guarantee flourishing. The best we can hope for is a system that leaves you as an individual free to try, to pursue, to achieve the best life that you can live. Because that to me is what morality is about. Achieving the best life you can live. We only have one life, as far as I know. One life, you gotta live it. 
You got to make the most of it. And when it comes to politics, when it comes to society, when it comes to a political system, we want a political system that gives us that opportunity to go for it, to try to live the best life that we can live. That's my standard for what is moral. It's not to impose a particular way of life on anybody, but it's to give them the freedom to make the choices about the way of life they want to live. And by that standard, and I'm open to being challenged on that standard, and I'm sure some of you will, but on that standard, there is only one moral political system, only one, and that is the system of capitalism. So what is capitalism? What we have today is not capitalism. There is no capitalism today in the world. Capitalism is a system in which the government is such that all it does, its sole responsibility, its only job is to protect our freedom, to protect our ability to make choices. It's to protect our freedom to act, to act in this world, to act in pursuit of our values. Government has no other role under capitalism. So in capitalism, the government, for example, has no economic responsibility, does not intervene in the economy at all. So it does not regulate, it does not control, it does not centrally plan, it does not tell you what you can and cannot do. It does not tell you how you should or shouldn't live. The whole point of capitalism is that it leaves you free, free to make your own choices. Free to make your own decisions. Free to live your life as you see fit. It doesn't try to dictate your life for you, whether in your personal realm or in your economic realm. Capitalism is a system that recognizes that each one of us, each one of us as an individual has inalienable rights. Rights mean freedoms of action. Each one of us should be free. Should be free to take whatever actions one wants. Good actions, bad actions, whatever actions you want. Free of coercion. Free of force. Free of authority. Free of somebody compelling you to behave in a particular way, to do a particular thing, to act in pursuit of anything in particular. The role of government under capitalism is to protect that freedom. In other words, to leave you alone, protect you from your neighbor, protect you from crooks and thieves and fraudsters, protect you from foreign invasion, arbitrate disputes so that we don't have duels in the streets. And other than that, leave you alone. So that you can make choices about your own life so that you can decide the kind of life you want to live. Capitalism is inconsistent with the platonic view of philosopher kings who know what's good for you and are going to dictate to you what's right and what's wrong and how you should live. We abandoned that view of society a long time ago, but we still dabble in it. We still live today in what I would call a mixed economy, what many call a mixed economy. We have some freedoms, for the most part, well, you can do what you want. You can, you know, we still have free speech for the most part. You can say what you want in most countries sometimes. You can sleep with whoever you want in most countries sometimes, not everywhere. You can live your life as you see fit. You know, for, for most things, you can even start your own business if you get the right permissions and if you ask nicely and in some places if you pay off the right people. And you can usually employ who you want. You can't necessarily fire who you want, but you can certainly employ who you want. So we have limited freedoms. We have some freedoms. Some countries a little bit more, some countries a little bit less. But in every country, we have governments that intervene in almost every aspect of our life in one way or another. We are not free. Our income 
is big chunk of our income is taken away from us. Uh, we are controlled and regulated in our business lives. You are controlled and regulated in every aspect of our economic life, what we sell, who we, uh, you know, how we hire people, how much we pay them, is all dictated by a philosopher king who knows better than us. We don't have the choices. We don't have the ability to act free of coercion, free of force, free of authority. We live in a world in which authority tells us what to do all the time. So I believe we should reject any model where we institute before us philosopher kings to tell us how to live and what we can and cannot do. You know, we don't call them philosopher kings anymore. We call them bureaucrats, regulators, politicians. But that's what they are. They know better how you should behave. They know better how much you should earn. You, they know better what you should or shouldn't produce. That to me is immoral. It's none of your business. Leave me alone. That to me is the right ethical approach to living, to trading, to interacting. So I think capitalism on a theoretical level is the only system that is moral because it's the only system that leaves individuals free to pursue their own values, to live their own life based on their own standards, based on their own minds, without coercion. We live in mixed economies that coerce us constantly. But let's, what about capitalism in practice? Right? How is it done in practice, in reality? Now, first, let me say, and I know the left says exactly the same thing I'm going to say, but I'm going to make the contrast, that there really never has been capitalism as I just defined it. There's never been a complete separation of state from economics. Now, the communists say the same thing, of course. There's never been real capitalism. There's never been real communism. We need to try it next time. It'll, it'll work. Next time, we'll get it right. And this is the difference. The difference is that to the extent that you try socialism, certainly to the extent that you try communism, it is by the standard of human flourishing an unmitigated disaster. It leads to nothing but death and starvation. Everywhere it's tried, everywhere it fails, at whatever scale it is tried, whether it is a scale of a commune, a kibbutz, or a Soviet Union or China, it always fails and leads to death and destruction. Maybe not death on a kibbutz, but destruction, certainly. Capitalism is the opposite. To the extent that capitalism is tried by the standards of human well-being, to that extent, it succeeds. To that extent, people are better off. People are wealthier. People have more options. People have more choices. People have more wealth. People thrive. Capitalism is a system that has been dabbled with for 250 years and everywhere, no matter what place in the world that is tried even a little bit, it has unbelievably good outcomes. In spite of the anti-capitalist propaganda that you hear. I mean, the story of humanity is a story of endless poverty. We look at the history of mankind over the last 100,000 years. What you see is extreme poverty lived by well over 90% of all the population everywhere in the world. So for 100,000 years, basically income and wealth were flat. They didn't alter, they didn't change. Maybe they got a little bit better under Greece and Rome, and then they went down and they stayed the same pathetic life how long did people live back then? Anybody know? What's the average life expectancy? Yeah, it was well under 40, right? And then something miraculous happened. Because at some point, just on a scale of income, wealth, but also life expectancy, suddenly everything went up dramatically, not a little bit, not a little Greece or Rome, but suddenly everything exploded so that today, in France, your income and wealth 
are well over, on average, well over 300 times what they were 300 years ago. 300 times. But in real, in terms of quality of life, the quality of your life is thousands of times better than it was 300 years ago. How do you value? You can't value monetarily the value of having running water and toilets. How do you value electricity? In economics, we can only measure dollars or francs or euros. But in terms of quality of life, our life is much better than we can measure it in terms of in those terms. We have today the kind of wealth that nobody 300 years ago could have even imagined. You live the best lives any human beings have ever lived on this planet. By any standard of wealth, income, your life expectancy is probably over 100. Mine is probably less. Yours is probably well over 100. And if the right scientific breakthroughs happen, it could be a lot over 100. And there's no limit to the wealth, to the success you can have. What happened to lead to this inflection point of exponential growth in every measure of human well-being? What happened? How did we go from, anybody know how many people were in extreme poverty 300 years ago, globally? What percentage of the world population was extremely poor? The UN defines extreme poverty as $2 a day or less. How many people were extremely poor 300 years ago? Over 95%. Yeah, over 95%. How many people are extremely poor today? In the world, not, not, not in France, but in the world, globally. Anybody know? Yes? It's like an important number, right? 20%, Any, anybody else? More than that, less than that? 10%, what's that? Think Africa, think Asia, think the whole world. It's 8%. We went from 90 something, 95% to 8%. 40 years ago, 30, 40 years ago, it was 30%. In the last 40 years, the greatest advancement human beings have ever seen in terms of the defeat of poverty has happened. And you don't even know about it. We've gone from 30, 40% of poverty, extreme poverty, to 8%. We should be celebrating in the streets, but nobody celebrates. It's, it's a good question as to why. Right? How did that happen? How did it happen that over the last 300 years, poverty has basically almost completely been defeated? And if you project another 50 years, it will be. There will be no poverty in the world. How? What had created that inflection point about 200 and something years ago? Well, the ideas, ideas created that inflection point. And those are the ideas, the same ideas that are fundamentally behind the system of capitalism. 300 years ago, or really 200 and 230 years ago or so, the ideas behind capitalism were embraced in certain parts of the world. And those parts of the world exploded in terms of economic growth and progress. Human flourishing took a massive step forward. Those ideas of free markets, of free choices, of the ability of the individual to make choices about their own lives, that didn't exist 300 years ago. Who, who decided what profession you would have 300 years ago? Depends what your father did. If you were a woman, we know exactly what you did 300 years ago. No profession, zero. It's only capitalism that made it possible for women to actually work and to actually leave and pursue their own choices and their own values. Otherwise, you did what your father did. You joined the guild. Who decided who you married 300 years ago? You didn't. Your family did. All choices were done by some authority. Who decided what the right science was? Not scientists. Religious authorities. In every aspect of human life, authorities decided what happened 200 and something years ago was that authorities were shattered, individuals were freed to make choices for themselves, entrepreneurs created businesses, businesses employed people, standard of living rose, wages rose, productivity rose, and we all became wealthy. Because we tried a little bit of capitalism, not all the way, just a little bit. And the more we try it, the wealthier we get. 
Most of that happened in, in Western Europe, in the United States, in the 19th century, in the early 20th century. But Asia, over the last 40 years, has caught up. We see exactly the same pattern in Asia. You see that once you free up and liberate the individual and let them make choices for themselves, economic choices and life choices, but primarily economic choices, suddenly they become rich. So when we liberate India, when we liberate China, when we liberate South Korea, when we liberate Taiwan, suddenly they become rich because they use the same methodology we all became rich by. They tried capitalism, again, limited, not all the way. I wish they'd gone all the way. They would be even richer today if they had. But in every single case in human history, at least the history of the last 200 and something years, countries that have embraced capitalism have led to massive economic growth and individual human flourishing. The ability of individuals to live their lives, pursue their dreams, pursue their values. Countries that didn't do that remain poor, where people have limited opportunities, limited choices, and don't get to pursue their values. And those, I think, are systems that are immoral, systems that allow individuals to live, to flourish, to pursue choices, to pursue values. That's what it means to be a moral political system. So even a little bit of capitalism goes a long way. If we really had capitalism, if we had a truly capitalist system, it's hard to imagine how much better off we all would be, uh, we all would be today. So capitalism is not only the only, the only moral political system. To the extent that it is tried, it is the only system that has led in human history to human flourishing, wealth, and the defeat of poverty. Thank you. Just, uh, just a reminder, uh, I'm reminded, uh, you, I think you were given a couple of pages like this. Uh, the first one, this one has a barcode. Um, you can get a free copy of Ayn, any one of Ayn Rand's books, uh, if you'd like one. Some of you might, some of you might not. Uh, but it's right, it's right there, you just scan it and you can pick the book that you want and they will, uh, they will get it to you. And then the second one is a conference we're holding, the Ayn Rand Institute is holding in two weeks in London. Uh, you invited, uh, the information is there. I'll be there. There'll be uh, lots of other speakers. It should be a lot of fun. Go for it. So we'll start, be starting off with a question for me. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to quote GK Chesterton, then I'm going to ask the question. So it is capitalism that has forced a moral feud and a commercial competition between the sexes that has destroyed the influence of the parent in favor of the influence of the employer that has driven men from their homes to look for their jobs that has forced them to live near their factories or their firms instead of near their families. And above all that has encouraged for commercial reasons, all that was called dignity and modesty by our mothers and fathers. So my question is, can a system therefore be called ethical if, as a consequence, it drastically perverts priority, spurring the destruction of family life by institutionalizing the pursuit of wealth over community, decreasing the amount of time parents spend with their children, and eradicating the virtue of humility by idealizing greed? Yeah. <laughs> God. Um, <laughs> children. How many children before capitalism lived to see the age of 10? You want to talk about time with children? Before capitalism, what did children, the ones who survived, 50% didn't reach the age of 10. The ones who survived, what did they do? How many children went to school in the pre-capitalist world? How many? Almost none. Maybe the aristocrats. But almost 90 plus percent of children worked in the fields. From day in, from uh, uh, sun up to sunset. What time did the parents have with children? Parents were exhausted. Parents often died young. Women often, often died of childbirth. I mean, how many women today child die in childbirth? Almost none. It's very close to zero. That wasn't the case not that long ago. So no, nothing has enhanced the family more than capitalism. Indeed, I don't know that there was the concept, the concept as a broad concept among 
everybody in society, not among the people we make movies about, the, 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 the aristocrats who, yeah, they had plenty of family time. But nothing has promoted family more than capitalism because it makes it that kids stay alive, that you have time. I mean, we have more leisure time today than people worked back then. I mean, restaurants. Anybody know when the first restaurant came into being? First restaurant, I mean, real restaurant, not, not a, 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 at a lodge where you slept and also ate, but something where you went out just to eat and experience uh, some uh, gourmet chefs cooking. Anybody know when the first restaurant was created? Because restaurants are modern. When was the first restaurant? It was it was the, the, the late the late eighteen hundred the late the late seventeen hundred so the late eighteenth century um, uh, in Paris first restaurant ever people didn't have time or money or wealth to go to eat at a restaurant I eat five times a week at a restaurant today literally my wife won't cook so we eat out all the time vacations. So restaurants are completely modern phenomena, completely a phenomenon of capitalism. There was no going out to eat. There was no that experience of eating gourmet food or eating different types of food. I mean, the idea that you in Paris can get Japanese food and Thai food and Chinese food and African food and all this stuff, that's completely a phenomenon of globalization and capitalism, not a phenomenon of anything else. Vacations. I mean, if you guys have been on a vacation, everybody here has been on a vacation. In France, you basically live your life around <laughs> August when you can go on vacation. There's no such thing as vacations. There were no hotels. There were no resorts. There were no swimming pools. You, you basically work every single day. And you stayed at a lodge when you traveled somewhere because you had to travel somewhere, not because you were going on vacation. Vacation is a concept, again, a modern concept and a product of capitalism. Nothing else. We'll get to your questions, I promise. How, I, is, it, how, is, that product? how is it a product of capitalism? Vacation is a product of wealth. You have to have enough leisure time. That is, you have to be so productive as to be able to, in eight hours, uh, build, create, make enough so that you can live and then have extra above and beyond that to pay for a restaurant and take some time off so you don't have to work every single day. You can only work five days a week. All of that is a consequence of increased productivity. It's a consequence of the fact that today I in an hour can produce what somebody in the past took a month or two months to produce. That is completely a product of capitalism. That is a product of the Industrial Revolution, the freedom that came about during that period and the dramatic increase in the productivity of labor over the last 200 years. And, and, and that productivity of labor only increases in capitalist, in relatively capitalist societies, a society that has a little bit of capitalism. Freedom is a prerequisite for the increase in the productivity of labor. You don't see productivity in labor increase in societies that are not at least somewhat capitalist. So vacations, restaurants are completely a product, a result of the fact that capitalism is so good at creating wealth. Because you can't have any of that without wealth. We'd still be farming. Not to mention the fact that we have, how many, how many people do we have on planet Earth? Eight billion people? You couldn't feed eight billion people on planet Earth without capitalism? You couldn't. Without industrial farming, you cannot feed eight billion people in the world. Suddenly you haven't been able to. You wouldn't have been able to over the last 50, 60 years. Every aspect of human life today is possible at the level in which we live it because we, we have maintained just a little bit enough capitalism to keep us going. And the more we diminish it, the more we put that lifestyle at risk and the more we decay. So all of the values that we care about, I mean, think about, so I love classical music. I assume some of you probably do, maybe not, I don't know. You're young, maybe you don't, right? Even classical music, think about classical music, right? When was the first time a composer could actually make a living from his composition and not be dependent on some religious leader or aristocrat to fund him completely? When did this happen? Because right? today, 
musicians can, you know, they can, they can make money directly from us. They don't need a patron. When did that start? When did the patronage system disappear? Well, it's the same thing with the beginning of capitalism. Beethoven has concerts and he sells tickets and people come to listen to Beethoven concerts and he makes money off of those concerts and he makes a living that way. He also had patrons because he, he was the transitional figure, but he makes money off of a new middle class, a middle class that's being created by what? By the introduction of capitalism, by the introduction of industry. And suddenly people can afford, people can afford to buy sheet music. People can afford to take piano lessons. And suddenly music teachers, that profession never existed. Suddenly you have this proliferation of music teaching. Every aspect of culture, every aspect of family is enhanced by capitalism, not degraded by it. I gave a long answer, so there was a second question. Oh, okay. Wow. Um, <laughs> sure. Um, any, anything from uh, the stories about capitalism that claim, and you know, we can make a list of claims, claim, for example, that capitalism leads to economic crisis. Uh, so for example, the story that I'm sure you've all heard, because it's, it's very successful propaganda, it's so successful, it's now in your textbooks, that the Great Depression was caused by capitalism. Or something you all lived through, you were little, but you lived through it, that the great financial crisis was caused by capitalism. Greedy capitalists on Wall Street caused the financial crisis. The technical term for that is BS. If you don't know what BS is, I'm happy to spell it out for you. Um, and I'm happy to explain to you what caused the financial crisis and why it wasn't capitalism. That it's bizarre even to think it was capitalism. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna give you the, 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 the five minute version versus the eight hour one, which is available on YouTube if you really want it. Uh, which I've done. I've done a, a whole course on this. What caused the financial crisis is a whole series of uh, regulations and attempts to control lending uh, in the United, primarily in the United States, that then kind of expanded all over Europe because of uh, because of the interconnectivity of the financial uh, of the financial world. Um, so in the United States, we decided uh, sometime in the nineteen. 90s, uh, I mean, really in the 1930s, but it was intensified in the 1990s, that everybody should own their own home, that renting was passe and, and, and not socially good, and we should encourage everybody to own a home, whether they could afford it or not, uh, whether they could, so out with the rent, make, uh, get everybody to get mortgages, take on debt, uh, and, and build a home. So we, we, we uh, by government regulations, by government control, we reduced the standards by which we issued mortgages. Uh, banks were encouraged financial institutions to give mortgages to pretty much anybody, no matter what. As a consequence, really, uh, one of the consequences of this was rising uh, prices of homes. Everybody started demanding. You could get zero down mortgages at very low interest rates, subsidized wholly by the government. The government subsidized it, they insured it. So the banks didn't care because the government was subsidizing it. The government was insuring it, so they issued the mortgages. You take away all the incentive for them to protect against risk. Uh, and of course, this can't go on forever. Uh, people took out, oh, Alan Greenspan in 2002 came out and said, it doesn't make sense to take a fixed rate mortgage, a 30 year mortgage. If you look at history, it's always better to take a variable rate mortgage. You know, a variable rate mortgage, the mortgage rate changes as interest rates changes. So everybody went out, because he's the expert, he's, he's the head of the, Federal Reserve, he knows what he's talking about. So everybody took variable rate mortgages. What happened when interest rates started going up? Well, suddenly their variable rate mortgages became much more expensive than anybody had told them. Suddenly people couldn't afford to pay their mortgage back. Suddenly there started to be this cascading effect of mortgages going out. Uh, and these funds that have bought repackaged mortgages and everything else started defaulting and everything started collapsing. But it all was a consequence of a central planner, a philosopher king deciding, you all should own your home, you all should have mortgages, and we, the government, will incentivize you, completely disregarding, completely disregarding how markets work, risk, incentives, what that actually does. So again, that's a short version. We could go as deep as you want to go, but that's just one example of 
the, the, the kind of idea that uh, these crises are caused by capitalism when none of them have. The, the, the Great Depression was caused by the Federal Reserve, which is a government institution, not a private institution. Um, so that's one myth about capitalism. Other myths about capitalism, I don't know, that employees are exploited under capitalism, uh, which is a myth uh, about capitalism. Um, I don't know. I'm sure you guys can think of all your claims. Most of your arguments against capitalism are these kind of propaganda myths. Let's see, in the back. I'll uh, move around. Yep. But who is that? I mean, it can't be everybody. If capitalism wouldn't work if everybody was brilliant, things just wouldn't work. You have to have some that are richer than others. You have to have some that exploit others. That's how capitalism works. And so uh, my question is that. Like, uh, yeah. yeah, I get it. So, so no, your assumption is, is wrong completely. Uh, everybody benefits. Everybody can benefit. I'm not saying everybody does, and I'll get to why. Uh, uh, Inequality is not a sign that some people were exploited and others were not. Inequality is a natural aspect of freedom. If you take, I mean, you guys are all smart. You are all pretty brilliant, I'm sure, because you're at UC University, and yet you don't get the same grades. I mean, it's weird, but there's no equality in this room. You don't get the same grades. Some of you get Bs and some of you get As. I'm sure nobody gets a C ever in this class. <laughs> And some of you might, on occasion, once in a while, get an F. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe some universities in the United States don't allow the professors to give Fs. I, I, you know, I got into trouble if I try to fail a student. But so inequality is a feature of human nature. We're not the same. We're different. Some of us are better at math. Some of us are better in philosophy. Some of us are not good at school, but we're good with our hands. Other people are really good figuring out business. So the idea that we should be equal in outcome is absurd. You don't have that at university. You don't have that in school. And you shouldn't. Because the fact is that some of you do better at exams than others. You don't all do the same. I'll get to all of your questions. So <laughs> relax your hands. So, so, and the fact that you get an A and that she gets a B doesn't mean you're exploiting her. It just means that you maybe studied harder for the exam, maybe. Maybe, and I'm, I'm not suggesting this at all, you know, you're more intelligent than she is. And therefore, you got a higher grade. But the fact that you got a grade doesn't mean that a higher grade doesn't mean you exploited her. It just means you have different skills, different talents, and that you, in this particular thing, are better than her at it on this day. Maybe on a different day, she would beat you at it. So inequality is a feature of freedom, not a bug. It's not a flaw. It's not a sign of exploitation. And exactly the same thing happens in business. Why do some people make a lot of money? Because they're good at it. And some people don't make a lot of money because in that aspect of life, they're not as good. And who benefits, who benefits the most from billionaires? Here's one of the mythologies about capitalism. We'll keep, we'll keep coming back and adding mythology. Who benefits? from the existence of billionaires in a free market. I'm not talking about the oligarchs in Russia. Who benefits from uh, billionaires in a free market? Everyone. Everyone. Why do I buy an iPhone? This costs a thousand bucks. Why do I buy this for a thousand dollars? And Apple makes a, a, a profit on it, makes a lot of money on this thing. Uh, a lot of billionaires, well, at least two billionaires have come out of Apple because of this. Who benefited more from this, Steve Jobs or me? I know. <laughs> That's why I said in the past. I said benefited, not benefits. I didn't get that, but you'll explain it to me afterwards. So who benefited in the past more from this, me or Steve Jobs or Steve Jobs' widow, if you want to go that way, right? <laughs> What's that? Yeah, but who benefited more? I mean, I'm serious. Who benefited more? How do you quantify? It's a good question, right? I, I, I'm convinced that I benefited more. He got more money, but you know what? I don't value money that much. Money's cool, but I'm happy to pay $1,000 for the iPhone. Why? Why am I happy to pay $1,000 for the iPhone? 
I can afford to do a lot of things with those thousand dollars. I can even keep them. I can go to a fancy meal. I can do a lot of things. But why am I willing to pay a thousand dollars for the iPhone? By the way, almost everybody today has a smartphone of one kind or another. Yeah, because I get more value out of, a, out of that iPhone than a thousand dollars. How much utility do I get? I mean, it's immeasurable. How do you measure the fact? that I can talk to my kids before they go to sleep from anywhere in the world, anytime, from any place. How do, you, how do you tell them a midnight story? How do you measure that? Steve Jobs made that possible. How do you measure the fact that I have access to every piece of music ever written in all of human history at a marginal cost of zero? Steve Jobs made that possible for me to do that. And think about the million things, the fact that I found this university is only possible because of Google Maps. Who did that? I'm not talking about Google, I used Apple Maps, so it wasn't Germans in Berlin. <laughs> and the Germans in Berlin ultimately got paid pretty well for that. Uh, ultimately, they were, yeah. So, no, there's no exploitation going on. Uh, there's, no, there's no exploitation going on. I benefit, Apple benefits, uh, everybody in the ecosystem benefit. People who use Samsung benefit because there's competition that makes Samsung better. What's that? Nobody makes $1 a day, but okay, $2 a day. Why, why are they working for $2 a day? Why are they working for $2 a day? Why does anybody in the world work for $2 a day? What choice do they have? Nothing? Really? Really? God. You guys, you guys should, 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 should go to China and ask them why they're willing to work for $2 a day. Because they have a choice. Have a choice to do what they did before they had the job with Apple, which was what? No, not nothing. There was no unemployment in China. All these people did something before they worked for Apple. What did they do? They, they, they were farmers, just like all of us were 300 years ago. They were farmers in eastern China, uh, western China. They cultivated the land. And then suddenly there was an opportunity in the city to make like 10 times more money. Now, for you, it seems ridiculous because you're spoiled excuse me, but you are in a comfy middle class Europe or oh, upper middle class middle uh, European life. And you can judge the farmer in China that says, you know what, I'm going to go to the city, I'm going to work for Apple, I'm going to send money home, because they usually leave their kids with the grandparents and the farm. And the alternative is I stay on the farm, and I live a pathetic life that goes nowhere for the rest of my life. But I can go to the city, I can build a little wealth, I can send money home so my kids have a bit of money i can advance i can get better at what i do i can become more productive how do you think we went from 1.2 billion chinese living at below extreme poverty to a situation today where only still a big number but only 400 million live in extreme poverty 800 million people have come out of extreme poverty in china because of what because of social services because of redistribution of wealth, Mao tried that and 30 to 100 million people died. The way they got out is because people went to the factories and worked. Sweatshops are the only way people come out of poverty. We had sweatshops in the West in the 19th century and we got more productive and we earned more and we rose up and we became better. But you wanna take those choices away from them. You wanna tell them, no, 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 no. You can't take that job because it offends my European sensibilities. But they choose it. They hiked thousands of miles to get those jobs. And if you go and live among them, they're ambitious. They want to do well. They want to do well at their jobs. They want to get a better job. They want to maybe start a small business in Shanghai. They want to be middle class, just like you. But the only path to middle class, there are no shortcuts in life. The only, middle, the only path to middle class should is to start with a simple job. Now, I know you guys probably come, most of you, come from families where that's not necessary. But when you don't have anything, that's the starting point. You're not gonna, nobody's gonna give you the stuff. Chinese government doesn't have the money to give them. They have to produce it. And they start at the bottom, and they rise up, and their standard of living goes up, and they become better off. And that's how we get a middle class in China. That's how you get a middle class in India. India has more people, it will have soon more people in China. And it was the same story. When it was socialist, it was dirt poor. 
When it started liberalizing in 1991, it started to become richer. Yes, people have to go through sweatshops. It's sad, but that's life, that's reality. And if you take that away from them, they will never achieve anything. All right, yeah. Yep. You know, that's, it may, I don't know the history of France, so it's quite possible that in France this was instituted from above, but it was not instituted from above in the United States and in the UK. Uh, there was, there's always been a tension between uh, labor and, uh, and, and, uh, and management, and there's negotiations, and there's, and, and that's, a, that's part of the business. But the, the idea of vacations, is the idea of enhancing, of, of allowing people to rest so that they can be more productive. It's clearly in the interest of business to allow people to have vacations. And in the United States today, most places have more vacation time than the government mandates, right? Because, you know, it works to have happy workers. Happy workers are more productive. Happy workers are more profitable. Happy workers uh, do a better job. So one of the goals of a productive business is to, to, to make it possible for people to produce at maximum level. Yes. So in a capitalist system where same values are justified by differences in wage, like mm -hmm. you just talked about, what does that entail? Everyone starting from the, from the same level, from the quality of opportunity, and thus entail So we should reuse uh, genetic engineering to make sure we all had the same IQ and we all had the same intelligence because you want to create a start, a, a equal starting point. Is that, is that what's implied? Look, there is no such thing as an equal starting point. You, you can pretend, you can imagine, but there is no such thing. Reality does not abide by equality. There is no such thing as equality in real life. The only sense in which equality has meaning, that the term equality means something, is equality before the law, equality of rights, equality of freedoms. The, the, the fact that neither, that nobody should be coerced, that nobody should, uh, should be defrauded, that nobody should be attacked and, and assaulted. That's the only sense in which we have there's a meaning to equality. We're all different. And we're always going to have different circumstances. And we're always going to make different choices. And we're always going to have different genes. Always. And I don't want to make everybody the same. I mean, what a boring, horrible world it would be if we genetically engineered everybody to be the same, to have the same starting point. No. you got to make the most of where you are. And, and it's sad that some people don't have, you know, even the basic. What, what are you going to do? with the fact that some parents are, are, are just more loving and just better than other parents. You're gonna take the kids away and raise them like in a kibbutz uh, collectively, and therefore they don't, get, they don't get challenged by the particular parents that they have. That was a disaster in the kibbutz, I wouldn't recommend it. No, you have to accept the fact that people don't have equal starting points. And then what you need to do is not equate opportunities. You gotta, you gotta maximize the opportunities they have. Give them the most options, the most choices, so that they can find their own path in life. And that's what capitalism does. Capitalism maximizes the opportunities. All right, the girl in the back and then the guy in front of her. Yes, you. If you have what? what? Right, so what you're saying is that the fact that somebody is sick, the fact that somebody cannot access, let's say, healthcare or cannot access uh, the choices, 
gives them, let's go back to morality, gives them a moral right to take my stuff, to make my life worse. And I say no. I have my rights, they have their rights. They can ask for my help. They can ask me to help. And, but you know, I might be generous, I might not, depending on who it is. But their suffering, anybody's suffering, is not a moral claim on those who are not suffering. It's, again, they can ask for assistance, they can do it. I mean, I'll get to the, the reality of this in a minute. But um, there's a lot they can do, but they don't have a right to pull out a gun and take my stuff. Now, the fact that they asked the government to take my stuff and give it to them for them doesn't make it any more just. They're coercing me. They're using force on me. I think force is evil. I think force, when, if I hold you up in the street, that's wrong. If I mug you in the street, that's wrong. I think when the government mugs me in the street, which is what they do all the time, that's wrong as well. Force, coercion, taking people's money against their will is wrong, period, without exceptions, even if it's for a good cause. Now, let's be real about healthcare in America, because God, this is one of the big misconceptions Europeans have about the world. But, but let me correct that, that Americans have about their own system. If you have health insurance in the United States, you get the best health care in the world. Bar none. I know it's, it's a reality. I'm a little older than you. I use health care a lot more than you do. Young people don't use health care. So, yes, socialized medicine is great. You can walk into a clinic when you've got the sniffles and not have to pay anything. But if I have cancer, there's no place in the world you'd rather be than the United States. Indeed, people who have the resources in Europe and get cancer, where do they go? They don't stay in Europe. Even in France, which has the best healthcare system in the world, according to the United Nations, they get on a plane and they go to the Mayo Clinic or the Cleveland Clinic. My health insurance will pay for me to go to the Mayo Clinic in the United States. So if you have health insurance, you can have access to the best healthcare in the world. Not enough people have access to health, health insurance in the United States. Absolutely. Why? Not because of capitalism. Capitalism creates products for the poor. We want the poor to buy insurance. We can make money off of them. So why don't the poor have health insurance in the United States? They don't have it because of the, of the, uh, of the regulatory regime that restricts the kind of insurance policies they sell in America. So I used to live in California. I don't anymore, luckily. But in California, if I wanted to buy a health insurance policy, it had to cover acupuncture. I've tried acupuncture. It doesn't work for me. I, I, I don't need it in my health insurance. I have to have it because insurance companies are mandated, include acupuncture. I'm not going to have any more kids. Yeah, a little old for that. Yet, I have to have pregnancy coverage. My wife has to have all kinds of coverages that she doesn't need anymore. I have to have all kinds of coverage I don't want anymore. But the state... The government mandates that those be included in insurance company policies to protect us. So what you don't get is cheap policies customized to the customer. Like I can buy a cheap car. You know, it could be small. I, you know, I rented a car here in Paris, manual shift. Uh, but it, it got me from Paris to here and it'll get me back. And it's pretty safe and it's pretty good. But if I wanted to, I could splurge and get a Maserati. I don't need a Maserati to get to Reims. I can use my little Citroen. I learned to drive on a Citroen, so it was a little, it was nice. But, but you don't have that. Everybody has gold-plated uh, Maseratis as health insurance policies in the United States. Most, a lot of people can't, 10% of the population can't afford them, and they go uninsured. Other myths about healthcare in the United States. How many dollars, how many cents do you think of every dollar in healthcare in the United States is spent by the government? Yeah, I mean, the United States has a private health care system. It's capitalist. What percentage of the dollars spent on health care in the United States is spent by the government? Well over 50%. The United States has a socialized health care system with a little bit of privatization. The fact is that if you're over 65, you go into Medicare, which is basically socialized health care for the rest of your life. If you're poor, you go into Medicare, Medicaid, which is socialized medicine for poor people. Healthcare in the United States for, you know, a middle class person who has health insurance is bar none, best in the world. My dad is a doctor in Israel, socialized medicine. Much rather go to a hospital in the U.S. than in Israel or in France or in any country I travel to. Wow. All um, oh, right, I said you. Yes. 
Do I? I, I the, it, it, this is a very interesting debate. It's been introduced in the yeah, other yeah, right? yeah. Um, it's like the COVID, right? And no, I didn't. I, 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 I attribute it to a bunch of different factors, one of them being intelligence. It could have been hard work. It could have been that she partied last night and she's just not completely awake for the exam. I mean, there's a multiple uh, reasons why you would have that. But the point is that he got a better grade than she did. Right, right. But, I mean, there are lots of causes. Yes, there are lots of causes, right? And yes, yeah, sure, there's like very clear response to like very small numbers of things. Uh, but and I want to talk about like very clear response to things on a more like natural basis. Like when you say capitalism, right? Uh, like very clear response to capitalism. No, I, I, I get it. I get it. Because, I mean, you get as much capital as you produce. Let, let, let me finish, right? So you think Steve Jobs sits around in and off a shuffling paper, yelling at people and being obnoxious, right? And, and he gets $2 billion for doing that. No, Steve Jobs is the guy who makes it possible for millions of people to have jobs. Those jobs wouldn't exist unless he had the vision, had the insight, had the ideas, the organizational skill, the productive ability to imagine iPhones, and then to assemble an entire supply chain from 50 different countries to bring it all together so that somebody could put all the stuff together and, 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 and actually do the little bit of physical labor, which in a few years a robot will do, and there'll be no jobs in that, um, in order to assemble the iPhone. But the fact is that the the, 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 the productive, what Steve Jobs does is worth billions of dollars. What I do, I, I speak in front of groups like you, right? It's not worth billions of dollars. It, it's not. Now, yeah, I mean, you might have an argument. It's not, it's, it's a negative value, but uh, I get it. But it's, it's not worth, because I, I don't access billions of people. Steve Jobs did. I don't change the world in the same way Steve Jobs did. I don't produce a, 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 a concrete, benefit to humanity in the moment, the way Steve Jobs did, he produced billions of dollars. Every billionaire out there, again, in a free market, in a relatively free market, is that productive. And the people who do the, the simple jobs of assembling an iPhone are not that productive. They, how, many, how many iPhones can one person assemble? That, you know, and, it, and all he does is one little piece in an entire supply chain. But the brain power, the, the insight, the, the vision, that had to go into imagining the whole thing and then putting it all together is a gazillion times more productive than that one person. Yeah, but who can produce like billions of dollars of like spending by doing it, right? Well, it's the people with and the big thing. Yeah, because his capital remains productive. His capital is not static. If the capital is static, he'll lose it all. Why is he not producing anything more? He's, he's, he's imagining future iPhones, he's imagining ITVs, he's imagining new uh, Mac minis, he's, he's constantly working. By what standard? How do you decide? So, so let's say we decide to pay the guys in China uh, 10 times what they make today. And, and it has an impact on your, your iPhone price goes up. And a certain percentage of you, not you in this room, but some percentage out there can't buy the iPhone anymore because it's a little bit more expensive. And uh, they stop buying it. So the number of iPhones shrinks and some people lose their jobs. And that's okay with you? By what standard? How do you decide how much to pay somebody? No, it's not central authority. The, the fact is, it's not central authority how much you get paid at all. Your pay is determined by how productive you are and by the competition for your labor. And that is determined by how productive you are. The more productive you are, the more you will earn. And if you follow people in China who started out with sweatshops, as they learn the skill, as they become more productive, their wages go up. Some of them go up dramatically. Because, not because of the benevolence of their managers of Apple, but because they're worth more to Apple. So Apple pays them more. And why are they worth more to Apple? Because they're more productive to Apple. Now, why is the capital keep earning after Steve Jobs is gone? Because the capital still keeps working. So I, I invest in, in, in companies. And my investment is what makes it possible for those companies to hire new people, 
and to create new products and to grow their business and to create the economic activity that all of you benefit from. So the capitalists put more effort and more thought and more work than most other people, and that's why they benefit the most. The, the, the pyramid, Marx's pyramid of exploitation is upside down. The most, the people who contribute the most to an economy, the people who contribute the most to wealth creation are the capitalists and the management and the people who contribute the least to wealth creation and to production are the workers. That's why they get paid the least. It doesn't mean morally they're different. It's just economically they contribute the least. Yeah, no, I, I, I get it, and I agree, right? So, so what about, what about uh, the extreme cases, and there are such cases, of, of children, and, and not just children, but people forced to work in mines. Uh, this is forced labor in many African countries uh, to do this stuff. Okay, who's at fault then? No. No. Good, our country. If those African countries had capitalism, none of this would be happening. If those countries, because under capitalism, you can't force anybody. The whole point of capitalism is you don't put a gun to anybody's head. That's how I define capitalism. The whole point of capitalism is the extraction of coercion from society. So what would happen if the mines in Africa, and if there was rule of law in, in, in these countries in Africa, and there was actually private property in these places in Africa, and therefore people could compete for labor and labor could compete for jobs, then they would still mine the cobalt for, for, for Apple, but now they would have to pay their laborers because if their laborers didn't work, they would, have to, they, would, they would leave for something else. The whole point, the whole solution for Africa, right? The, the solution to the poverty and the oppression and the, the horrific conditions the children and others live under Africa is capitalism. Africa is the last continent not to experience a capitalist revolution. And as a consequence, it's the last continent in which there's such adjunct, I mean, there's still parts of Asia and still parts of the Middle East that are still like this, but that's because they haven't experienced it yet, where you have this, this horrific uh, poverty and this horrific conditions and the horrific coercion. But that's because they don't have capitalism. That's because they haven't experienced the protection of property rights, they haven't experienced the protection of individual rights, they don't have a government that respects the rule of law and pe treats people equally before the law. They're not suffering for other, other continents capitalism. They are, if, they, if they embraced capitalism, they would benefit enormously from the demand from other countries for their raw materials, which would raise, which would raise their standard of living. The problem in Africa today is they generate a lot of wealth from their natural resources, and it goes to whom? And don't say Apple, please. It goes to the warlords. It goes to the gangsters who run these countries. It goes to their polit political class who has massive bank accounts in, together with all the Russian oligarchs in, in Switzerland. It goes to the people in power. But the point of capitalism is that the wealth doesn't go to the people who have guns, the people who have political power. The point in capitalism is that the wealth goes to the people who are productive who manage production, who make production possible. And that is a completely different system. So if you want us, if you care about Africa, then you want them to embrace the things that made France rich, which is property rights, respect for human life, rule of law, equality before the law. If you did that, then they would get rich because the rest of the world would demand the natural resources they have there, but that wealth, would be not just going to the gangsters, it would be going to the people who actually produce the work. Yes. Um, so I just wanted to ask, so during those early ages of capitalism, right yeah. after the Industrial Revolution, you would say that that was maybe the healthiest or most accurate to see the kind of capitalism that we envision, correct? Well, legally, not, not in terms of the standard of living and the quality of life. Okay, yeah, because so that's what I was going to ask was sure. um, about the fact that the conditions that workers experience at those times, you know, eight-year-olds Having their fingers chopped off, and, yeah. you know, abused and steel. It's, it's, it's fascinating to me, right? So in 1800, 
50% of all children die before the age of 10. By 1900, 95% of them make it to age 10. In uh, 1800, um, you, you know, the standard, the, the uh, life expectancy of a child born is less than, well less than 40, and by 1900, it's well over 60. Uh, in every respect, over these, if you look at the beginning and then if you look at the end, human life has improved dramatically, even the, you know, by then. It, it, you know, you say uh, it, their hands were chopped off and they have suffered all these injuries, as if on the farm that never happens. As if when they worked as, as laborers on a farm before capitalism, that never happened, if they, if they actually lived, right? Because most of them didn't even survive uh, uh, working on the farm because of the poverty uh, that they inflicted. So yes, capitalism in its early stages, just like today in other countries, is not pretty, not aesthetically pretty, but it's necessary. There's no other way to get from one point A to point B. There's no way to get, why do you think children went to school at the late 19th century? Because nobody went to school before that. Why did they suddenly go to school? Now, I know the conventional wisdom is because governments forced it. And that's, again, BS. They went to school because parents now made enough money to be able to pull their kids from work and send them to school. And only then did government pass laws that said you have to send your kids to school. So. It is capitalism that made it possible for kids to go to school. Yes, they worked. And in every society out there that is poor, children work, whether they work on a farm or work in a factory, because those societies don't have enough money to send them to school. The parents can't feed the kid on what they are making. So they have to have the children work so they can feed them. And as soon as the parent make enough money, so that the kid doesn't have to work, they take him out of the factory and send him to school. So yeah, it can get unpretty, but that is a necessary step in order to achieve the kind of progress we benefit from today. Uh, well, I don't know, because I'm not sure what, to, you know, if you have the wrong views, then yes, drop out and, and, and go do finance, because all we, we don't need more philosopher king politicians. You don't have to be philosopher kings. So, uh, you know, my favorite politicians, uh, and they're flawed, so don't, don't, you know, I know they're flawed, I know they're not perfect, so don't start, are the founders of, of the U.S. And I know many of them have slaves, I know that is a blemish on them forever. But the fact is, as politicians, not as human beings. They generally set up a system that basically was the right kind of political system. The system that protected individuals, that recognized their rights, recognized their freedoms, and left them alone. And the system they created was so good. I mean, the Declaration of Independence is so good that at the end, even the fact that they owned slaves was inconsistent with the document that they wrote, and they had to fight a civil war in order to change that. And it's a was a just war. And it, it, it's too bad it didn't happen 60 years earlier, right? Um, so you can be a politician who does the opposite, who doesn't act like they know how people should live and what's good for people and, 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 and what's right for them and, and, and so on. But you can be a politician that actually liberates people and frees them up. And you know, you know I think the people who suffer the most from good-natured politicians are the poor. Because you treat them like children, not, not you, but you in the future, because you're all going to become politicians, right? You treat them like children. You treat them like they don't have a mind of their own. You treat them, you know what their job should be. You know how much they should get paid. What about all the people, uh, you know, I don't know, France have a minimum wage? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, minimum wages, minimum wages, basically make it so that the, that the least educated, least able people can never find a job. They just never work. And, and you can see this all over the world, any country that has a minimum wage, there's a certain percentage of particularly young, particularly minority, poor kids who will never ever have a job. Because if I, 
if, if, they, if they can only produce at $2 an hour and the minimum wage is $7 an hour, nobody will hire them. But you feel good because you know what? You raise the minimum wage to seven bucks an hour and to hell with those kids. I say no. I say if somebody is willing to pay them two bucks an hour and they're willing to work for two bucks an hour because it's better for them than the alternative they have, which is to be on welfare and let them do it. Or think about the welfare payments. You think again, the welfare payments is helping people, but is it? It's telling people that they can't take care of themselves, but that the government is gonna write them a check and they can live off of other people. Is that a good psychological message to people? Do you think welfare recipients have the kind of self-esteem that poor people maybe did 100 years ago when they worked for a living? And yes, they had a modest life, but they worked for a living. Work is important psychologically to your self-esteem. Yet you want to take people and tell them not to work. Here, give the money. UBI is popular now, you know, a, a universal basic income. Yes, let's pay people not to work. You want to destroy people psychologically and their self-esteem? That's a good way to do it. So you can do the opposite. You can free people up. You can, you, and, and that's what I hope politicians of the future will do one day. Doesn't look very promising, though. No. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. You're getting me in trouble. Um, I am a strong believer in separation of state from, from church and a separation of state from ideas. So the state should not have ideas. And the people and the state should be so limited, so constrained that their ideas should not make a difference. That is, again, I envision a state in which politicians have very little to do. Uh, the legislature is primarily involved in helping define new applications of property rights. The internet creates a lot of new things in which we need to think about property rights and so on, for example. Uh, maybe the legislature meets, I don't know, six months, every two years. It doesn't have to be there all the time. What the hell do they have to do? I can run my life. I don't need them to tell me how to do it. So I think you limit the legislature and you try to keep religion and ideas out of the state as much as you can. Uh, religion is corrupting. Religion is always corrupted. It's very corrupting of politics. It's, you know, I won't get into personal life, but, uh, but no, I, I, I don't want my politicians to be any ism. I want them to be, I'm protecting you. That's my job is to protect you. And I'll figure out how the best way to protect you is. It's a, it's a, it's a profession. It's not a ideology. Yeah, so, but the, the beauty of, again, the beauty of it is that they don't legislate sex, right? Because they're leaving you free, so you do whatever you want with their sex life, counter to the conservatives in America who would like to regulate your sex life. They don't tell you who to marry and who not to marry, because it's not a state's business who you should marry. Uh, you know, they don't have any power over your life. What they clearly define is, when, you know, here's the kind of technical boring stuff politicians should be doing. They should help define what is first degree murder versus second degree murder versus accident of killing. What should be the different penalties for the different things, not the intricacies of how we live. Oh, okay. Okay, so, no, I get it, I get it. So, 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 so I think that's a myth too. I don't think it's due to the Protestant work ethic. Look, capitalism is a consequence of a, a long historical process that starts with the Renaissance in Europe. Yes. Prove what? So give me something you want me to prove. I can prove to you that minimum wage creates unemployment. I'm sorry. So, so I don't understand. I don't understand what it is you want me to prove.
Yes, I think it's a scientific process with real proof. So parts of it are proofs in economics. So the idea that workers are not exploited can be proven uh, in the field of economics, and you can prove it by, by looking at productivity and by looking at, at the division of, of, uh, of value across different work fields. Absolutely can prove that. I can prove mathematically that uh, minimum wage uh, creates unemployment. A historical question about what role did the Protestant work ethic play in the development of capitalism, I can give an hypothesis. I can tell you my historical story. I, it's not mathematics, so you might interpret it differently, right? But I would, I would argue that the source of capitalism is not Protestant work ethic, but the secularization of Europe and the elevation of reason. The, the, you know, by, by the French Enlightenment and the Scottish Enlightenment, the idea of, of, of the efficacy of human reason, the idea of the value of the individual over the value of the group or the value of authorities from the church. It is the rejection of the authoritarianism of church authorities, or if you want Protestant, it's the rejection of the authority of a book. Right? In Protestantism, you don't look to the Pope, but you look to the book. The book is the authority. And it's the rejection of those ideas that I think, and again, if we had the time, we could go to a whole history lesson, that led to the idea that I have a mind, I can reason, I can figure stuff out for myself, I don't need these authorities, and therefore, I don't accept that you tell me what profession I go to, I don't accept that you tell me who to marry, I don't accept that you rule over me, I want a, this, I want a say in all those things, I want to live their life based on my reason, my mind, not on an ancient book, not on what the Pope says, not on what the King says, but what I say. And that liberty that I think was rediscovered by the West during the Enlightenment, but really the process started in the Renaissance, is what led to capitalism. And Protestantism had something to do with it in the sense that it liberated us from a Pope, it liberated us from a particular hierarchy and a particular authority, but it wasn't a crucial thing. The crucial thing, in my view, is the scientific revolution and the Enlightenment, because that's what liberated the human mind. That's what led to it. Now, in history, you can't prove things mathematically. I, you know, you can go and read and try to find cause and effect throughout history. That's my interpretation of the cause and effect. I think it's right. Otherwise, I wouldn't say it. And I'm pretty sure it's right. But you guys will have to judge for yourself. I, I, you know, I can't in a in a in a Q and A give you long proofs for everything. My job here, look, like just, a, just a point, right? Teaching is not about getting into your mind and changing things. I, I'm not trying to change your mind. What I'm trying to do is create doubt because doubt will cause you to think and it will cause you to go read a book. And oh, I wonder, he said this point about, I don't know, minimum wage. Let me go research that. Let me go do, that's all I want because I know I can't prove everything to you, to your satisfaction, to every single hand in the room, right? So I'm trying to create what's, co what's called cognitive dissonance, enough cognitive dissonance, I hope, to cause you to think about it later and to cause you to read a book and maybe even download one of those Ayn Rand books and, uh, and, uh, and, and read them. So I don't know what you want to do. There's tons of questions. Are we going to go for as long? We'll do two more questions, okay? <laughs> we'll, we'll start to wrap it up. All right, she's really eager, yes. <laughs> Sure. However, I'm wondering, in a perfect capitalist system, yeah. how would the capitalism, and a perfect capitalism, you would deal with the ongoing true science problem? How would you deal with... Um, you were going to ask the same question, so we, we did a two for one, that's good. <laughs> Sure. I mean, uh, uh, in, in the Industrial Revolution is responsible probably for uh, climate change. Uh, there's a key question you have to ask about climate change. Uh, you know, it's happening. It, the, the globe is warming. Um, 
the key question is how destructive and how quickly is it destructive? That, that is, how, how, how urgent is it? Is this an emergency? Is this like an asteroid heading towards Earth and we know it's going to hit at a certain point and we're all going to die? I mean, let me, let me finish, let me finish because otherwise we'll never end this, right? Um, because if it is, if, if, if it's unequivocally the asteroid hitting us and, and we're gonna all gonna die and it's gonna destroy the human planet, then yeah, you, you've gotta do some emergency stuff. And in emergencies like that, you've gotta get together and, and, and change, the, change life as we know it and, and deal with it. Deal, that becomes priority number one. And look, capitalists, you know, the nice thing about greedy, selfish capitalists, and I, I say those terms with affection, is that they wanna live. They wanna live. So if it's true that the asteroid is gonna uh, hold, if, if we actually saw an asteroid, I don't know if you saw this stupid movie, Don't Look Up. <laughs> but I think the one point that they got right is the billionaires of the world would care <laughs> because they're gonna die. Now they ridicule him and they make him look stupid and they make it ridiculous, but they would care because they, they, they don't wanna die. Nobody wants to die. So indeed, I think if we had an asteroid holy towards Earth, I think the, 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 the people most competent and most able to deal with it is probably Elon Musk and a bunch of people rather than governments who can't do anything right, right? So the first question, is it an asteroid holding towards Earth? I don't think it is. So, so let, me, let me put my cards on the table. I don't think it is. Okay, but, so, but, so I live in the Caribbean. Where do you live? Puerto Rico. So do I. I do. I do. Oh, yeah, you're a Puerto Rican. I've, I've lived in, yes, because of the tax benefits, absolutely. <laughs> um, uh, proud, proud of it. Uh, I've I lived in Puerto Rico for four years now. Um, so, yes, I, I moved to Puerto Rico three months after Maria devastated the islands. I know exactly what you're talking about. But the fact is, and, and, and this is, and I'm not going to, we, we're not going to argue this. This is science. You're going to have to go do your own research. I'm sure many of you have. But there's no increase in hurricane intensity or the number of hurricanes yet because of climate change. I'm not saying it couldn't happen, but the scientific fact is it hasn't happened yet. But, but let me give you a much more important statistic. And I don't have a blackboard because I'd love to have a blackboard to do this. What, how many people die every year from climate related issues? Is it growing? More people are dying every year because of climate related issues? Put aside the air contamination, it's a different issue. We're talking about climate change. Climate, climate change from, from tornadoes, hurricanes, heat waves, freezes, droughts. All of this stuff. Are more people dying today than 20 years ago? No. No. I mean, go, go based on UN numbers, based on whatever numbers you want, go look at the number of people who die from climate related catastrophes has actually been declining for hundreds of, for, for the last 200 years. Why? I mean, it's obvious to me why, right? How did people live in Puerto Rico? Poor people, let me finish. Unfortunately, poor people in Puerto Rico still live in shoddy homes and they're the ones who suffer. But as we become richer, what do we do with our homes? We build them stronger, we build them better and we don't die because of weather related issues. If, if, if there's a heat wave in a rich country, what happens? You pay a lot of electricity bills because you use the air conditioning. You don't die. If there's a freeze in a place where you can warm, you don't die because you can use heating. The fact is that the solution to all climate crisis is technology. It's to make our life more resilient to it. I was just in Amsterdam. Amsterdam is below sea level, not because of climate change. It's been below sea level for hundreds of years. And yet it's a thriving city. How? They build dikes. So one possibility, I'm not saying this is the only possibility, but one possibility to deal with climate change is to enhance our technologies to be able to live well as the climate becomes more variable, as the climate becomes less predictable. So the only way in which human beings survive. The only way, and we, 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 as far as I know, are an animal and a part of nature. We're not extraterrestrials. We're not something different than nature. We have evolved 
from apes. We are part of nature. And nature has granted us this unique thing, which is the way we survive is by changing nature. The way we survive is by exploiting nature. Other species don't. If the weather changes, they die. We don't. And everything we do changes nature. We build a house. How do we do that? We chop down trees. We blow up a mountain and use the, use the, the rocks. Everything we do, there's not a single human activity, certainly not in modern times, but even in olden times. Once we stop being hunter gatherers, every single activity we engage in is using nature for ourselves. And yeah, we do it very well. And the challenge is not to do it to an extent that it destroys us. It hasn't yet. As I said, life expectancy goes up. Health is improving. We're living better lives. It's never been a better time to live on Earth right now than you guys are experiencing. You might be miserable because you've told about all this, these horrible things, but the fact is you live in the best of times in spite of the decline in biodiversity, which happens naturally anyway, and, and it goes in cycles, and there are lots of these cycles. Uh, but even if human beings are doing it, so what? So there are, there are fewer animals out there. There are fewer species out there. But we are thriving. And what does it matter? What matters is that we are thriving. That's the purpose. The purpose is not uh, to maximize biodiversity. The purpose is for human beings to do well, because we're human beings. The lions don't care about, the, about, uh, about human beings. They don't care about other species. They care about lions. We as human beings care about human beings. Now, we, we want to make sure that we don't do things that destroy our ability to live on this planet. I don't think we're doing anything to destroy our ability to live on this planet. Uh, if anything, we're underinvesting, underinvesting in technology to make it possible for us to live better lives, to deal with climate change better, to build, I mean, one of the best ways to deal with climate change is to eradicate poverty. Now, eradicating poverty is going to require burning fossil fuels. Because the fact is, Africa is not going to get rich with solar panels. They're too expensive. They're too inefficient. Africa will only get rich if they burn fossil fuels. So again, you middle class, wealthy, well-to-do Europeans are going to get, tell Africans, stay poor because we want to save the planet. Well, if I was an African, I'd tell you where to shove that. And I think they will. I don't think if you listen to, the, to Africans, they don't want that. They want to get rich, just like we are rich. And the way to get rich is industry and technology and jobs and, 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 and they make stuff. And by the way, sell you food. You know, do you know, why, you know why the European Union doesn't import food from Africa? If you want to help Africans, lower trade barriers and buy food from Africa. But you won't because it's much more important for you to protect rich French farmers than it is to help Africans. If you really cared about Africa, you'd advocate for reducing tariffs and allow them to export food to you so that, so that they could get rich off of your consumption of food. So, you know, climate change is a problem. We'll deal with it with technology. You cannot deal with it by destroying civilization. You cannot deal with it by tomorrow stopping to use fossil fuels because that would destroy civilization. It's not an asteroid hurling towards Earth. It's a slow death if it happens. It's a slow change. But getting the, wood get, the Earth getting warmer and having more CO2 in the atmosphere is not our biggest problem on Earth right now. It's not. The fact, the fact, let me just, one last thought. The fact is CO2 is good for the trees you love. There are actually more trees because of CO2. There's more algae in the seas. There's more greenery because of CO2. That's just a fact again. There's more forests in the United States today than there was 200 years ago um, because we, we don't use as much land for agriculture as we used to because technology has improved. In every aspect, human progress is good for human beings. It's not disaster for human beings. The disaster is slow. Stop being so depressed. You know, every generation <laughs> thinks, no, I'm serious. Every generation thinks that you will lead to the end of the world. Earth. Every generation, you can go back, millennial cults have existed forever. Climate change catastrophism is a millennial cult. It's just another cult of the world's going to end tomorrow, let's pray to somebody. Or let's shut down civilization in order to save ourselves. It ain't happening. I, I, rem I still remember when Paul Ehrlich wrote a population bomb uh, and said hundreds of millions of people would die of starvation in Europe in the 1970s. Or 
Earth is going to freeze, or the million other catastrophisms of the last 50 years around environmental issues. I'm not saying there are no environmental problems. I'm just saying it's not a catastrophe. It's not going to happen tomorrow. Greta is wrong. You have many more than eight years to live and enjoy life. Stop worrying so much. Have fun and think about how to make your life and the lives of the people you care about better into the future. Okay, last question, but how do I choose? No, this is boring. No, no, I'm just trying to consider because you mentioned, like, for example, in the case of healthcare. Yeah. Like, you know, people I'm not an anarcho capitalist. Indeed, anarcho capitalism is a contradiction in terms. Okay. You but, cannot have capitalism without government. But why should you force people to buy the insurance against violent crime when you say that they shouldn't have to? First buy of all, I'm not forcing them to do anything. You don't want to buy insurance? Don't buy insurance. You don't want to pay for your government? Don't pay for your government. I know I'm, a, I'm an idealist. I would want to pay for police and a, and a military and a, and, a, and a court system. But I'm not gonna force you to do anything. I don't believe in force. I don't believe in coercion. I am consistent, not believe in coercion, but right? By what mechanism do we ensure that things like the police or firefighters? By the mechanism of voluntary association. If people want to have a police, they'll have to pay for it. And if they don't wanna have a police, they'll suffer the consequence of not. I mean, in America, we're doing an experiment right now of defund the police. People don't want to pay for the police. They're defunding the police. Crime rates are going through the roof. People suffer when they don't pay for it. Uh, you know, so leave it to voluntary association, voluntary payment, and let's see what happens. But uh, the idea of making force something that we trade, something that we trade in, that coercion is a market product, is, it, it completely undermines the whole foundation of capitalism. Markets can't exist unless you extract force from them. And that you have to have a special institutions to do. And, and you don't want to call it government because libertarians don't like that. Don't call it government. I don't care. But you need a, a monopoly over the use of retaliatory force. But the only job is retaliation, not the initiation of force. That's only done. It's like your tactic is just done because it's done voluntarily. No, but sure everybody does. And look, here's an experiment, right? I told you, you know, here's some homework if you if you want, right? You know, people want slow growth and, and, and it, it, people, so take, take this, take, what, is, what is the lowest wage people get make in France? What is, what is like a poverty wage in France today? An annual wage? Anybody, anybody know? What's that? How many euros? 20,000 euros? 15,000 euros? What's that? What's that? 1,500 a month, which is what? Which is 18,000 a year. So let's say 20,000 a year just to make round numbers, right? So let's say 20,000 a year. Let's say you make 20,000 uh, euros a year in France today. And let's say we grow the economy into the future at about what it's growing today, which is somewhere between 1% to 2% a year. And let's assume, I mean, again, a, a generalized assumption, it's not accurate, that your wage will grow with the economy, which it does if you look at, at, at wages. Uh, some grow slower, some grow faster, but the lowest wage grows with the economy at 1% a year, 1% to 2% a year. Do that. So take that. And say in 40 years, what will the what would the poorest people be making uh, in? So you take you take one percent, you do it compounded over 40 years, and you look at what the wage will be. And I don't remember by heart what that number is, but it's 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 the richer than they are today, right? But they're still still not a huge number. It's not a, an amazing number. Now take that, and instead of one or two percent growth, put five percent, just just a little bit bigger, and compound that over four, four, uh, over 40 years. And what you'll discover is that in 40 years, if economies grow at 5%, there are no poor people, not from an objective perspective. There might be relative poverty, there's inequality, but there are no poor people. Because at 5% a year, everybody gets rich very, very quickly. And when you give up on economic growth because of climate change, because of social justice, because of whatever you want to call it, what you're doing is you're keeping people poor. What you're doing is preventing them from becoming rich. And I'm talking rich. Somebody making 20,000 a year at 5% growth within 40 to 50 years is making well over 100,000 euro a year. Well over. 100,000 in, in real terms. That's a, pretty good, that's a pretty good living wage. Imagine the whole population is making more than $100,000 a year. 
right? And we don't have to worry about anything. Nobody's really poor in, in that kind of society. That's what capitalism produces. We're this close to getting there. And you want to put the brake on us. I mean, you're already putting the brake on it because we're already only growing one, two percent. You want us to grow at negative percentage points in the name of climate change. I say, let's go at five percent and we'll be so rich when it gets warmer. We'll have vastly better technologies to deal with it. We'll suck the CO2 out of the atmosphere. We'll do all kinds of things that we can't even imagine today. But if we stay poor, yeah, we'll have a problem. The, the solution to most of these problems is to get rich. And for that, you need more capitalism, not us. Thank you.